Welcome to the Tech Takeover. Is everyone having a good time? Yeah, okay. I'm joined here with uh, Professors Radha Mahalcha and then Professor Ben Kuypers, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the technology you see in 2001 Space Odyssey relates to kind of the work that we're doing in Michigan engineering. We're going to focus on spacecraft propulsion, robotics, and artificial intelligence. So my name is uh, Alec Gallimore. I'm a professor of aerospace engineering and the dean of the College of Engineering. And I'm going to focus my talk on advanced spacecraft propulsion systems. So as a starting point, what I'm showing in this image is a picture of the Discovery One spacecraft, which is a spacecraft in the movie 2001 sends the astronauts to Jupiter. This spacecraft is nuclear powered, about 700 feet long, and can travel at over 100,000 miles an hour. So to give you context, at that speed, it covers the distance between the Earth and the Moon in about two hours or so. So the question is, how close are we to developing that kind of spacecraft propulsion technology? And in fact, you're seeing an example of that in that display back there, the same plasma drive that is used on this uh, spacecraft in the movies and in the book is, a, is being demonstrated in that chamber over there behind you. But let me start with this question. Does science fiction drive technology or does technology drive science fiction? So let me give you some examples. I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. So this is to the left. It's from 2001 Space Odyssey. What does that look like to the left? iPad. iPad. 1968, an iPad. Wow, not bad. And then, of course, it looks familiar, right? How about that? So let me go back. Does science technology drive science fiction, or does science fiction drive technology? My answer? Yes. <laughs> it goes both ways, in my humble opinion. So what I want to focus on is why do we have a need for speed? We just launched with the solar probe, the Parker solar probe, the fastest human-made object. When that probe passes by the sun, it's going to be traveling at over 400,000 miles an hour. Earth to the moon in about 30 minutes, a little bit, a little bit under 30, a little bit over 30 minutes. So what's the need for speed? One is to get around space, it's all about trajectories. And what is a trajectory? Well, space travel is all about getting on and off the right conveyor belt. In this case, conveyor belt around the sun, around the earth, around the moon at the right time, and that's what we call a trajectory. And what it is, it's a balance between gravity from the sun or from the earth and movement. So let me give you a concrete example. Imagine you have a, a student here and she has a, a, a string with a mass at the end and she twirls it around. And clearly what's going on is that the rope is pulling the mass so it doesn't fling off. And her speed is keeping the, the rope, rope taut. You're saying, well, how does that apply to space travel? Well, actually that applies a lot because imagine now in space travel, she would be the sun the string would actually be gravity. The distance, though, is 93 million miles. So every time you look at the sun, think that sun is 93 million miles. And the Earth is moving around the sun to balance its gravitational pull at 67,000 miles per hour. A jet airliner moves at five or 600 miles an hour. So things in space tend to move very, very quickly. So how do we get things moving fast in space? Propulsion. And the one that's the most common is what's called rocket propulsion. And how it works is that we take a fuel like hydrogen or kerosene, and we mix it with an oxidizer like oxygen, and then we have it burn in a chamber called a rocket chamber, and it expands through a nozzle at about 10,000 miles an hour. And that gas moving at 10,000 miles an hour provides a force that accelerates the spacecraft. So how fast can rocket-propelled objects travel? Well. Anytime you send an object in orbit, like we used to do in the space shuttle, it, you have to be at almost 18,000 miles an hour. Remember, a jet airliner travels at around 600 miles an hour, 18,000 miles an hour. But wait, there's more. If you want to go to deep space, like to the moon or beyond, you have to go at 25,000 miles an hour, because at that speed, you break the bonds of Earth's gravity, and you can be in deep space. The fastest chemically propelled system that we have so far is the Pluto probe that was launched a few years ago called New Horizons, and that rocket sent a, a large rocket about the size of the Lurie Tower or even Bell Tower here, sent a spacecraft the size of a piano up to a speed of about 43,000 miles an hour. So that's pretty good. The question is, why do we need to go fast? And partly because space turns out to be really big. 
So let me give you a, do an exercise about how big space is in terms of interplanetary space. Imagine we have a scale where the distance between the Earth and the Moon is, the di is across your finger, right? So Earth is over here, the Moon is over here. On that scale, how far are some heavenly bodies from us, all right? So for example, Earth to the Moon is the width of my finger. Mars would be about eight feet. Jupiter, 65 feet. Saturn, about 110 feet. Neptune, longer than a football field. Interesting enough, the nearest star besides the sun, how far is that on that scale? Earth to the moon is a width of my finger. Well, the nearest star called Alpha Centauri other than our sun is 600 miles. And that is 4.2 light years away. The galaxy we live in is 100,000 light years wide, and the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is 2 million light years, and we expect the universe to be about 13 billion light years wide. So it's just mind-boggling size. Let's do it in time now. So we take that rocket that we launched to Pluto at 43,000 miles an hour, which is only about six hours to the moon or so. How long does it take? If you was straight line at that speed to Mars, at the closest approach, 60 days, it would take over a year to get to Jupiter at that speed, two years to Saturn, several years, seven years to Neptune, 600 centuries to the nearest star other than our sun. So one question is, let's talk about sending people to Mars. NASA has plans to do that in the 2030s or so. And if we did it with a chemical system, we can get there, but it would take nine months. And believe it or not, one of the challenges with having the trip take nine months is the safety and the health of the astronauts once they got there. There are some studies that show because of radiation that comes from the sun that the astronauts would have on average a lifetime 15 years less than if they had not gone because of radiation dosage, because of a high probability of getting cancer. 15 years. And so we want to do is see if there's a way of getting them there quicker. And so that speaks to this concept of electric propulsion. Instead of burning things like a fuel and oxidizer, we take the power that's on board the spacecraft and we heat a gas to tremendous temperatures. In a chemical system, it might be 5,000 degrees. In these plasma drives, similar to ones you see over there, they can be up to 500,000 degrees or so. And you need that energy to move these particles at tremendous speeds. So to my right, the image to the right, is a picture of a, one of the plasma drives we developed with NASA as a prototype a few years ago. So this is what spacecraft that will, say, send humans to Mars in the 30s will look like if they use electric propulsion. To the left is a solar electrically propelled system. It uses solar rays to power the plasma drives, and it may have a chemical rocket for kicks when it needs it. And to the, to the, excuse me, to the left and to the right is a nuclear-propelled spacecraft. And the reason we're interested in this electric propulsion is that we can cut the trip times down to six or maybe even three months. So you think about that chamber over there, and it turns out we have a much larger one in my lab. My lab is called the Plasma Dynamics and Electric Propulsion Laboratory, and our biggest chamber is 20 by 30 feet long. And what we do is we do work for NASA primarily and government uh, agencies like the Air Force to prototype and design and work with them to develop advanced plasma drives, including a prototype system that may one day send people uh, to Mars. It's very interesting. We lose a lot of robots uh, to use, do this work, some of the robot systems you've seen here. And what we do is we're able to provide a, pr a pressure that's about 10 billion times lower than the pressure that you have right here at sea level in the chamber when we're operating uh, these thrusters. And just to give you an idea of the scale of it, this is how big it is. It's actually one of the 10 most capable vacuum chambers on the planet in terms of size and, and its ability to maintain a low pressure. So it's pretty amazing. And we needed a, a chamber that big because the thruster that we're developing is also quite large. So this is a picture of a, the first prototype Mars engine, the first prototype propulsion system that may send humans to Mars and cut the trip times from nine months down to about four to five months or so. To the left, you see it next to one of my graduate students, who's now a, an engineer at NASA, Dr. Scott Hall. And to the right is the plasma drive operating in, in our vacuum chamber. And we received a lot of notoriety for that because we ended up breaking a number of world records in terms of power and thrust produced by a plasma drive. So the question, though, is, is this the system that's used on the Discovery 1 spacecraft in the movie? And actually, no. 
What they were going to do, and again, this was made in the 60s, so they were even more flamboyant in the 60s in terms of their thoughts, was they were going to use a nuclear propulsion system where they were going to take gas, uranium, that's highly radioactive, and mix it with a, a propellant and have it expand through a nozzle. Uh, very elaborate, but it requires a tremendous amount of power to do that. Realistically speaking, if we move fast forward 50 years, in order to achieve this kind of capability, we could do it probably in the middle of this century or so, but we probably wouldn't use this kind of uh, gas phase uranium type of drive. We would absolutely use one of the plasma drives like the kinds that I showed you before that we're developing. So with that, thank you for this segment. We're going to now pivot to the other elements. Uh, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. And just to tee it up, again, like I showed you images from the movie, the iPads and things like that, and the space stations and the space shuttles, just wanted to show you a couple of images. So for example, the top left is Hal from the movie. You all recognize on the bottom left what's going on, the Jeopardy. Uh, uh, um, the, um, the Jeopardy competition that was actually won by an artificial agent as well, as, as, as well as the chep, uh, chest championship being, being handled by a, a robotic system. So with that, I'm going to uh, pivot over and to invite my colleagues, uh, Radha, uh, to give the first presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share with you um, how I think that the past, present, and future of artificial intelligence relates to the movie that you are about to enjoy. Um, and I direct the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory here at Michigan. Um, this is a, a group of amazing faculty, uh, nearly 20 faculty working on the core areas in AI, um, covering um, aspects such as learning, vision, cognition, perception, language, robotics, um, and so forth. And I would like to start by going back in time. And I wouldn't even stop to the movie in 1968, but rather go even farther back to the 40s and 50s, uh, when Europe was torn by the Second World War, and when a brilliant mathematician by the name of Alan Turing has developed an algorithm that was helping people to break codes. He is probably best known for breaking the Enigma code. Uh, but another thing that he's well known for is this paper, which he published in 1950, uh, in which he addresses the question, can machines think? And what he suggested is that we could test whether machines can sing through a game. He called it the imitation game. And let's assume you are a participant in the game. What would happen? Uh, you would be invited to be a judge. You would come into a room. And then there will be a number of consoles. And what you have to do is to sit at each of these consoles in turn and simply have a conversation. The catch here, however, is that you don't know who's on the other side. So you have this conversation at the first console, and after that, you have to determine whether on the other side was a human or a machine. And doing this repeatedly, eventually, there might be a machine that say, if you do confuse it and think that that was a human, then we would say that that particular machine is actually thinking, and so that would have passed this imitation game, the way Turing put it. Now, over time, uh, that game changed name, and we now refer to it as the Turing test. Um, and it's one of the tests that we sort of live by in artificial intelligence. It's still one of our main goals. So the movie came later in 1968. And I would like to play just a fragment from this movie to see um, how a conversation can happen between a human and a machine. So as you can see, you could possibly, without have me having told you that that was a machine, you could have possibly confused that machine for a human. It's actually sounding very naturally, um, including inflections, the content, and, and so forth. 
I would like to also make a speculation. Like I said, Turing paper came out in 1950. Um, and what he also said in that paper was that we would pass this imitation game, or as we would say today, the Turing test would have been passed by the end of the 20th century. The movie is called 2001. So maybe the director was actually informed by this projection that Turing made by calling 2001, and maybe it wasn't necessarily intended as science fiction, but rather as a vision as to where we would be uh, in AI. Um, now, let's look also what was actually the state of affairs at that time. So in 1960s, there was a dialogue system. So there were systems that people built. Uh, however, they were nothing like what you just saw. Uh, they were, in fact, rule-based and using can responses. And here is an example from Eliza the therapist. Uh, it was built in the 60s, uh, but Eliza is still alive and well. You can actually test it out. So if you go on the internet and just look for Eliza, you can have a conversation. And this is the conversation that I had with Eliza just a few days ago, and it's fully unedited. So here is how it went. Eliza, hello, I am Eliza. <laughs> Me, hi. Eliza, how are you today? What would you like to discuss? Me, I'm giving a presentation on Friday. Eliza, do you believe it is normal to be giving a presentation <laughs> on Friday? Me, it is about the past, present, and future of AI. Eliza, come, come, elucidate your thoughts. <laughs> Me. Well, I was hoping you could help me here. Should I talk about you? Eliza. You are not really talking about me, are you? <laughs> me. You tell me. Should I? You are a good example of a rule-based dialogue system. Eliza. Do you sometimes wish you were a good example <laughs> of a rule-based dialogue system? So you can sort of see how this was going, um, how you could even predict what is going to say next, and it's all fully rule-based. Now, fortunately, there is a very interesting phenomenon uh, that is happening when it comes to progress. Progress is not linear. Um, progress, in fact, has this exponential shape. And one of the biggest proponents behind this acceleration of progress is Ray Kurzweil. And really, the effect of this, that what took 100 years in the past to happen is going to take 10 years next, and one year after, and so forth. Uh, so with that, we've been really making tremendous progress in the 60s. And I want to highlight just a few of the things where we made progress. One of them is hardware. This is the very first computer. It wasn't even called a computer. It was called the ENIAC. That was the proposed word for this thing. Eventually, it didn't cut up. Uh, we do proudly still have a piece of the ENIAC um, at Michigan. If you go in the College of Engineering, the Computer Science and Engineering building has one piece of this computer. Now, this, you see, it was a full room. Now, instead, we have the desktops. Uh, so these are very tiny, much more powerful than that one full room was before. We also have the data centers, which somehow, ironically, they look very much like those computers in the 46. You still see the wires and all that, still the room full of equipment. However, in terms of what they can store, what they can do, there is not even room for comparison. They are tremendously powerful. Another thing that happened um, is data. If we look back in 2000 and an estimate of how much data there was on the internet, we were talking about terabytes. So terabytes would be thousands of gigabytes. Then later, we started talking about petabytes, and that would be millions of gigabytes. Uh, then we had exabytes, which would be billions of gigabytes. And you see how we are even adjusting our language, because we don't have enough words to talk about how much data there is there. And who will know how we call what's out there right now? We have the zettabytes. So zettabytes is how much data there is there. Um, and this really means there is a lot of data that algorithms can learn from, so we can build all these amazing tools. Another thing that happened um, is, like I said, algorithms. Um, so in the 40s and 60s, 
40s, 50s, 60s, we had, surprisingly, neural networks. So neural networks, which are so popular today, were actually in introduced many years ago. They didn't eventually catch up because we didn't have enough hardware or the right hardware or the right data. Then, later, uh, we had, so that's starting year 2000, various machine learning algorithms, uh, decision trees, support vector machines, random forest, and so forth. And then for the past few years, we started having a lot of algorithms that are relying again on neural networks or deep neural networks, but this time with the support of the right hardware and the right amount of, of data. Now guess what was in between? There was winter. So that was the so-called AI winter. There was still progress happening, uh, but the trust of society was maybe a little less than what is there right now. And I will mention one more thing that I think changed significantly since the 60s, uh, and that's a very recent, so I cannot even put it on the curve. It's crowdsourcing. The fact that people like you and I are actually contributing to the algorithm, contributing to various bits of data. If I know, for instance, how to translate into French, I would contribute one French translation, you would contribute one, and then together we create enough data that we can feed a machine translation system. So what was the result of all this? A lot. We have human-level performance speech processing. Uh, so we get tools that can go from speech to text um, in a way that it almost looks like a professional transcriber. We have ways to process to text and understand what's being said, whether it's about a person or a location, whether there's an action and so forth. We have question answering systems that are able to answer the question that we ask, like Siri or Alexa. And we have machine translation that can translate between many languages of the world, and so many other things. Now, remember the ELISA system that was asking me whether I wish I were a rule-based system myself? Let's see where we are in terms of dialogue today. And this is from a demo this year, the duplex system that was introduced by AI researchers at Google. This is a system that is targeted toward a certain task, which is that of making appointments. But as you can see, it sounds pretty natural. So the question, going back to where I started, have we passed the Turing test yet? I would say not quite. We have made impressive achievements, and there was a lot that happened for the past 50 years. There is still a lot to do. There are still a lot of languages to translate. Uh, there is still a lot to develop in terms of doing question answering, in terms of building systems that can have natural conversation and so forth. And this is just talking about how we process language, and there are so many other areas. So I will leave you with my favorite curve shape, uh, progress is accelerating. And so the future is promising even more exciting findings. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I wanted to talk about AI and 2001. Um, one of the things, 2001 came out in 1968, as we've already seen. And it was just an amazing experience for those of us who saw it at the time. Um, it was <clears throat> the major arc of the movie, as you'll see, is the transformation of humanity from prehistory to post-history. And that was just a fantastic thing to look at in the psychedelic 60s. So a few years later, um, I started graduate school in pure math. And I ran across the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. And that grabbed my attention, took me away from pure math, and I decided that this would be the focus of my life's work. And I ended up spending my time on the problem of common sense knowledge, which comes up in a lot of different ways, space, objects, actions, and so forth. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a moment. One day at the Artificial Intelligence Lab, with no particular fanfare, um, who should show up but Arthur C. Clarke, who was one of the world's great science fiction writers and the author of 
the novel 2001 A Space Odyssey. My advisor, Marvin Minsky, was a great fan of science fiction, and he had been a consultant on this movie. He had helped giving advice on the nature of artificial intelligence and the design for HAL, who is the artificially intelligent system um, that we'll see in the movie. Now, HAL ended up being a huge inspiration for many people who went on into um, artificial intelligence. Um, and we see HAL carrying on very sophisticated conversations with people at a level that cannot yet be matched. Really, Hal's conversations are, are beyond the current state of the art in terms of coherence and um, just substantive uh, content, uh, even 50 years later. Now, Hal interacts with people through its camera and through um, its voice, but actually the whole spacecraft is essentially Hal's body. Its nervous system and its activities are taking place all through the spacecraft, as we'll see. Now, I'm sure it's not a spoiler to tell you that in the movie, Hal ends up being a bad guy. <laughs> so he's a villain. Um, and, but what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to a particular theme that comes up as we go through the movie um, in the part of this arc that, that deals with the space voyage. So during the voyage, we're going to start out and we're going to see Hal with, whoop, I hope. OK. So Hal and one of the crew members, is, is Frank, is playing um, chess. So this was fun. And you can go out and buy something that, that would let you have that much fun um, easily. But in the movie, one of the things, a much more serious game of chess is going to take place. And I just want to draw your attention to it. So here we're going to get the opening move in that game. OK. After some things happen, we get the end game here. Um, but this is not the end of the game. This is the beginning of the end game. So if our artificially intelligent systems start doing this, this could be a considerable concern. <laughs> um, <clears throat> however, I don't think that we're in immediate danger of this. Um, we have made dramatic progress over the last 50 years. and. Um, the AIs that we're building are really idiot savants. That is, that they're extremely good at some specialized thing, but they don't have anything like the kind of general intelligence that we're seeing in HAL. Um, there is a great deal of promise, um, but the risks are things that are manageable at the moment rather than catastrophic the way it is, um, is portrayed in here. Now, Nonetheless, the kind of progress that we've seen have, has encouraged a number of researchers in AI, including me, um, to think that there's another kind of common sense knowledge that we need to look at, um, which is ethics. And ethics includes knowledge of what is appropriate to do. It, ethics involves knowledge and skill. AI researchers can study how knowledge like that is acquired, it, how it's represented, and how it's used. Um, and <clears throat> we, would inve we investigate how, how robots, like people, will evaluate the things that they're considering doing so that they can treat people and treat everyone around them appropriately instead of treating them like chess pieces. Thank you. Thank you. We can do Q&A. We have a couple of people running the mics. If you're interested in asking a question, uh, I ask you to stand up and wait for the microphone and then uh, fire away, please. Mar the Mars rover, the, 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 that spacecraft this, that landed on Mars and they're, they're hiding in the, 
sandstorm right now? How much longer and how more things do we have like that that are in process? Oh, okay. So, so there are a number of rovers uh, being prepared. There's a, a rover called Mars 2020 that's being launched. And one of the goals of that rover is actually to collect samples and hold the samples for a follow-on mission called the Mars Sample Return Mission, which will have a robotic system that will bring those rocks back to Earth. And that's a precursor for starting to send people to Mars in the early 2030s or so. So an actual return. Yes. Yes. If you were to design a mission like in 2001, but try to mitigate the risk that you said came from having such a general intelligence, would one solution be to have just a whole collection of the idiots of idiot savant AIs that can't talk to each other? Probably not having them that cannot talk to each other, but I think we need to have um, a notion that an individual agent, an individual artificially intelligent agent, needs to know that it has a responsibility to the society. Now, in the case of a spaceship like that, it would be the society which is the crew. Um, here, Hal believed that it had a responsibility towards the mission, towards accomplishing this mission, and it was prepared to um, sacrifice um, make many sacrifices <laughs> um, uh, in order to accomplish the mission. Whereas um, we expect people to relate well to their society and to the other people in them and to treat them well. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, one question. So I know there's a lot of excitement over uh, deep learning uh, neural networks and machine learning systems, and they're used pretty much everywhere in our, all of our devices and our software. Um, but I was wondering, in terms of uh, developing true AI, is that, do you think this is the right approach? Are we sinking too much into one method to uh, develop these systems? Is, are, are there other ways that we can get to developing AI? I would say this is one of the recent findings um, and it's there is a lot of excitement around deep learning and so there is good reason for trying to apply that approach to a number of problems I don't think that solves it all um, I do think that eventually there will be other methods that will have to come into play um, and even now there are people who realize that deep learning is not the solution for everything um, and so we are looking at <coughs> alternative approaches as well for instance when you have a problem that does not have a lot of data Neural networks are limited there, so we have to think of other ways to tackle that. Um, one of the things that is an important thread of artificial intelligence research is asking, how does the knowledge in a particular domain get represented? How is it structured? How is it acquired? How is it used? And the, the methods of deep learning are, are very powerful, interesting methods, but they basically jump around all of those questions. And they say, let's take pixels in, and we'll get raw bits out, and then we'll grade those, and we'll train the things in between. But it never really asks those questions about how the, in, the, the, the intermediate stages need to be structured. And almost, certainly we will need to develop those intermediate stages. Kind of a question for both of you. Are there any milestones or applications for AI that you're particularly excited for us to kind of achieve or see AI in a particular field or anything like that? Well, I would argue, and of course it's biased by my own expertise and interest, um, in favor of natural language understanding. So actually, being able to determine what's being said, and not in the shallow way of just being able to classify a document, for instance, but in the deeper way of figuring out, for instance, what are the relations between the people that are mentioned in that document, and what is their emotion, or what are their actions, what are they planning to do, what are intentions, and so forth. So I think that is one major goal within AI, and particularly within my field of natural language processing. And, and I would approach that by saying, 
One of the things we know about human knowledge and human intelligence is that it starts out at a very primitive level. And children learn it through a huge variety of states of knowledge and different ways of conceptualizing the world. And it may very well be that looking carefully at that will give us more insights into the structure of the knowledge and will tell us stages that, that we will have to go through in order to create artificially intelligent creatures that actually can handle the world in as sophisticated a way as we, could, as we do. Uh, in a, on a political note, how much of this information is kept, is shared among nations? How much does the US say, keep it quiet, this is ours? I would say the stuff that we work on is shared publicly. That, that the function of science is to share the results and build on other people's results. So science is a, is a fundamentally idealistic process where we build on, um, build on each other's methods. And so I think a situation that confines this to individual countries or, or individual corporations that want relative advantage I think is fragmenting something that works best as a unified international worldwide process. Well, with that, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.